It's an honor to be here today. I want to thank Eden and Tom for giving me this opportunity to speak to you about parareality games, entheotrainments, and the psychedelic future of religion. Um, there's a whole lot of weird shit coming your way. I'm going to be relying pretty. Yeah, I'm going to be re relying pretty pretty closely on my PowerPoint presentation. So so please forgive me, um, and let me know if I'm not speaking clearly enough into the microphone. All right, here we go. Let's start with an oversimplification. You could say that in the modern era, there have been essentially two approaches to using psychedelics, or as I like to call them, the substantia. Let's call the first the therapist couch. It's highly individual. You take the substantia while in a clinician's office or alone in a dark room or out in nature. The goal is healing or self-knowledge. The downside is you are deprived of the opportunity to experience communitas, a sense of belonging that arises from going through an experience with a group. It's called the second one, the boom festival model. It's highly collective. Examples would be eating mushrooms at a fish show or candy flipping at Burning Man. The goal is recreation. The appeal is experiencing the exultant energy of merging with a group. The downside is that the emphasis on ecstatic joy can severely limit the potential developmental benefits of the psychedelic experience. I want to suggest a third model. Let's call it the fitness class. It works whether you're alone or with others. The substantia is taken within a structured environment. The goal is virtuosity. The appeal is that it's a reliable means for achieving that grandmother of all peak experiences, gnosis. It also allows you to channel the collective energy of a group into the private work of self-inquiry. The downside is that you will occasionally suffer. But as Benjamin Franklin said, there are no gains without pains. The fitness class model is based on something I call the phonomantic method. The phonomantic method is a groundbreaking set of assertions, concepts, and techniques that help develop skill with psychedelics and eventually allow you to exert a measure of control over the psychedelic experience. Traveler beware. If you're a recreational user, the phonomantic method might seem like too much work. If you're someone who is primarily interested in using psychedelics to treat trauma, depression, or addiction issues, you might find it alarming or even dangerous. That's because the phonomantic method is not therapeutic. It's augmentative. It builds supernormal psychological and spiritual capacities. The phonomantic method is based on the practice of phonomancy. Phonomancy is a way to induce visionary trance by dancing and singing along to popular recorded music while in a psychedelically altered state of consciousness. Eventually, it includes complex psychological tasks, visualization exercises, and sacerdotal oblations. Here are, the, here are the premises that phonomancy is based on. Every modern recorded popular song has been carefully engineered to create in its listener a specific emotional response. Psilocybin mushrooms tend to amplify emotional states. By listening to lyric-based music while in a psychedelically altered state of consciousness, one can have an amplified experience of a song's target emotion. Concentrating on this amplified tar emotional state, a subject can influence the character and contents of her, his, or their closed-eye visuals. If, while in an altered state, a subject can feel an emotion to a degree that passes a certain threshold of intensity, they are no longer feeling their personal emotion, but connecting to the collective human experience of that emotion, which is to say, its Jungian archetype. Along with the psychic and somatic energies released by this archetypal activation, God forms can spontaneously emerge in one's visionary space. These may be identical to culturally established images of the divine or entirely novel. In this state, any co-arising thoughts or images tend to be interpreted as direct communication from God. This kind of direct and immediate knowing of the divine is referred to as gnosis. In other words, phonomancy is not just getting high and listening to the dark side of the moon. It's a technique-based psycho-spiritual exercise system like yoga or tai chi. Each song that you work with presents the opportunity to enter practice and perfect an emotional asana. Phonomancy has three foundational techniques. The first is immersion. That's letting go and getting into the emotional space of a song. And that's something a lot of us do quite naturally when we're alone in our car or when we're in our bedroom standing in front of the mirror holding a hair hairbrush or a microphone. Right? The next is attention. That means avoiding distraction and staying on task and focusing on your inner experience. 
And finally, there's contemplation, which means engaging with the thoughts and images arising from the unconscious as you pay attention to your emotional states. In fact, phonomancy could be described as a form of psilocybin-fueled Jungian active imagination. The science fictional religion I'm going to describe today is based on the following observation. Your enjoyment of virtually any activity, whether it's watching live music or climbing El Capitan or eating street tacos or having sex, can be amplified by the presence of other people. This is true for psychedelically induced mystical experiences as well. Ugh, why religion though? These days the word religion is triggering for many people so I better explain what I mean by it. If spirituality is about your personal relationship to ultimate reality as you conceive it, religion is the way you can work with other people to have experiences of you are that surpass what you can achieve on your own. In other words, we don't have to treat religion as a noun. It can be a verb. Religioning is a neologism for something primal and timeless, the way people gather in groups to access the sacred. Psychedelic religioning will require readily understandable activities people can perform together, but it will also need a way to ensure any challenges that arise for participants in an altered state won't become somebody else's problem. Phonomancy offers the accessible activities. However, creating the conditions for a successful religioning at any scale larger than the gathering of a few close friends requires the phonomantic method's most important conceptual innovation, the phonomantic triad. Since the early 1960s, set and setting have been regarded as the determining conditions for a beneficial psychedelic experience. To these considerations, the phonomantic method adds three more S's, structure, stress, and skill. Structure makes it possible to shape the psychedelic experience. Stress turns the experience into planned opportunities to realize one's potential across multiple dimensions of self. Skill allows one to obtain more information from each experience and to participate in group efforts that can be a force multiplier. In this context, stru structure covers a lot of ground. First, it refers to a schedule. Every minute of a psychedelic session is planned out. Next, it means ceremony. The schedule is organized in a manner that opens, holds, and then closes a sacred space. Structure means narrative in the sense that the main ritual events of the ceremony are stories that lead participants through the stages of a hero's journey. And finally, there is activities. As part of these narratives, participants perform prescribed tasks at specific times. Let's talk about stress in, the ter in this context. Stress is what set and setting was designed to mitigate. And this is important for, to, uh, for those attempting to heal old traumas or deal with certain mental health issues. The wounded and the ill need the comfortable couch, the headphones playing Bach, the, the sitter's hand to hold. The psychologically healthy and psychedelically experienced don't necessarily need that level of support. In fact, they may very well benefit from the opposite of support. If traditional psychedelic therapy is comparable to physical therapy, a practice intended to help the injured return to normal functioning, then the phonomantic method is like a strength and conditioning program designed to develop in healthy people capacities far beyond the norm. And the phonomantic method, this is accomplished by subjecting prepared consenting trainees to titrated stress while they're in an altered state of consciousness. And here are the stressor types we use. The first is dosage, which is to say how much you take. Taking mushrooms is fun. Taking too many mushrooms, not that fun. It can be a source of stress. The next is environmental external. And these are the elements of your objective experience, which in terms of the phonomatic method will eventually include music, video, lights, costumes, and etc. Then there's environmental internal. These are the elements of your subjective experience, memories, realizations, reactions. These can be a source of stress. There's the environmental transpersonal, elements of your spiritual experience. When you take high doses, you enter shamanic reality, okay? And if you think about it this way, if consciousness is an infinite ocean of which we are a part, a psychic ecology, well, there's flora and fauna, and some of them want to eat you. And sometimes when you take high doses, you become highly vulnerable to them. And this is something traditional shamans have known for a very long time, but yet does, does not as yet have a model within psychedelics as they're being approached now. But you should know and you should be prepared. 
And finally, there's task-based. And these are actions to which you've committed, but which now seem daunting due to fatigue or fear. These can be sources of stress as well. In strength and conditioning training, you lift weights to get stronger. In the phonomantic method, you lift psychic load. A psychic load is any internal state that makes it more difficult for you to, to achieve your objectives. Distractibility, anxiety, disassociation, frustration, depression, terror, whatever. These may arise as a result of the aforementioned stressors or can be brought into ceremony as part of your set and amplified by the substantia. Phonomancers practice the skills of courage, clarity, self-control, self-overcoming, anti-fragility, and emotional flexibility to overcome psychic load. They learn to harness the nervous arousal caused by dosage, environmental, and task-based stressors to access deeper levels of consciousness. Camus said, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. And phonomancers say, one must imagine Atlas dancing. You want to get so strong that you can carry the whole weight of the world on your shoulders and still do a little soft shoe. Phonomantic skill is deployed in pursuit of catharsis. In drama, catharsis is purification and purgation of emotions through dramatic art. In psychology, it's the expression of buried trauma, bringing it into consciousness and thereby releasing it permanently. Phonomantic catharsis occurs when you access personal or transpersonal complexes that resonate with the target emotion of a song, with a concomitant release of psychic and somatic energy. Due to the emotion-amplifying properties of psilocybin mushrooms, this can be exalting or harrowing, depending on what you're purging. With sufficient dosage, phonomantic, phonomantic catharsis results in enthusiasm, a particularly visceral form of gnosis. Part two, that's entheotrainment. The ceremonial performance of sequence acts of phonomancy is known as a phonomantic rite. Phonomantic rites can be performed alone or in a group, in private, or in public. Public-facing group phonomantic rites are called entheotrainments. The words are three-way portmanteau of entheo, meaning God within, entertainment, and training. An entheotrainment is a spiritual group fitness class. Entheotrainments are elaborately staged participatory theater designed to create a direct, immediate apprehension of the sacred, which is to say, gnosis. Entheotrainments are a new art form, but likely they are also the return of something very old. The definition of entheotrainments could describe the purpose and content of mystery traditions like the rites at Eleusis in ancient Greece. Expressed as a recipe, it could go something like this. In just a substance that alters perception and heightens emotion, in the company of like-minded and like-intentioned others, engage with a story-based spectacle that pulls you into another world. Supported by the belief of everyone around you, experience this other world and everything it contains as real, up to and including the gods and goddesses themselves. Feel your understanding of yourself and the universe crack wide open. Emerge from that experience supercharged by enemies both thonic and celestial. Know you've been reborn. Return to the everyday world and find it similarly transformed. The modern incarnation of entheotrainment is a jukebox musical dance party with narratives that are the raw material for deep played games of make-believe. I've built a working prototype. It's called the First Church of David Bowie's Shamanic Cabaret. The cabaret... <laughs> The cabaret is designed to encapsulate a psilocybin-based journey from ingestion to return to sobriety. It's a group ritual, not a performance. Success depends on participants' contribution to the information density in the room. Here's an overview of how the phonomantic triad is practically applied in the context of the shamanic cabaret. Schedule-wise, the cabaret comprises 39 songs with interstitial narratives. Ceremonially, it's divided into an invocation, a processional, three liturgies, and a recessional. Each liturgy contains a complete narrative based on the hero's journey. The hero's journey is a story template common to myths from around the world. It unfolds in distinct stages. Each stage has an associated emotion. For example, in the film Star Wars, the emotion of the first stage, the ordinary world, is youthful restlessness. In the three liturgies of the cabaret, each song has a target emotion. These are programmed in an order that parallels the stages of the hero's journey. Depending on who you talk to, there are as few as three or as many as 22 stages in this hero's journey. 
Here are, the, some, here are some of the most commonly recognized. It goes from the ordinary world to the call to adventure, then the refusal of the call, the meeting with the mentor, crossing the threshold, text, tests allies and enemies, the descent into the cave, the ordeal, the reward, the road back, the emergence of the new self, and the hero returned with the boon. These stages don't always occur in the same order, nor are they all necessarily in every story. There are three liturgies in the shamanic cabaret. The first is called the stereo myth. It's a rite of transformation. There's a lot of hard rock and heavy metal. It's an opportunity to train masculine archetypes. The second is the transcendental disco. It's a rite of purification. There's lots of soul, new wave, and dance pop. It's an opportunity to train archetypes of the feminine. And finally, there's the Anne Frank working. It's a rite of atonement based on songs by indie folk rockers Neutral Milk Hotel. It's a meditation on fate, death, and rebirth. In each playlist, songs are sequenced by emotional target according to the stages of the hero's journey. Each song is also associated with an archetype or archetypal situation. By conducting visualization exercises and self-inquiry based on these images, participants improve awareness of these transpersonal forces. Integrating these contents into one's conscious identity expedites Jungian individuation. And so here's a schematic for the stereo myth. And on the left-hand corner, you can see the stages, right? The, um, the meeting and the mentor and the refusal of the call are folded into the narrative, but in, in the interest of time, I didn't include songs to represent them. And on the far right, those are the songs that I chose to go with them. Those are the ones that most closely match the emotional target that I was shooting for. The emotional targets are in the middle, along with the associated archetype, okay? And I'm not gonna go through all the songs, but I do wanna express it as I was developing this, it started to seem like some of these songs were almost purpose-built for this. For instance, the, uh, the stage where, the descent into the, where you have the, the, the descent into the cave is often equated with these, uh, the part of Jungian individuation where you encounter your shadow, which is to say all the parts of yourself that you don't want to acknowledge. And the Tool song, 46 and 2, is literally about encountering the shadow. Like, that's what the lyrics explain. And if you sing that song while you are listening to this very heavy, very sort of spooky song, and you ask yourself, show me what I don't want to know about myself. It's it's, you essentially entrance yourself, and you will get a response from the unconscious. And it can be pretty gobsmacking, because you start by excavating your own personal shadow, but then you start moving into the collective shadow after you do this often enough. And it's the same with all these songs. If everything goes right, you can actually start to experience some of the energy of the archetype associated with it. All right, let's talk about stress in the shamanic cabaret. The music is often at nightclub volume. Some of it is aggressive hard rock and heavy metal. Some of the images in the purpose-built music videos are designed to unsettle. Some costume staging and special effects are designed to shock. And close identifications with some songs may cause participants to unearth powerful emotions. And sometimes these emotions are painful. But that's kind of the point. <laughs> participants are tasked with singing, dancing, visualization exercises, and other ritual activities. These must be carried out despite the psychic load of being high, of, high as hell <laughs> in a very stimulating environment. The goal is to be able to conduct yourself with a near sober level of lucidity and self-control. This strengthens executive function outside of ceremony. Skill is the learned ability to accomplish specific tasks. Virtuosity is the ability to demonstrate great skill and make it look easy. The shaman, go-go dancer, tribute act, group fitness instructor, and sacrificial victim leading an entheotrainment is called a lead phonomancer. Lead phonomancers are tasked with displaying visionary virtuosity. Visionary virtuosity is the ability, while in a superheroic dose of psychedelic substantia, to deal with the vagaries of shamanic reality while maintaining global awareness of the external environment, while entering and exiting profound trance states at will, while, super, while conducting psychospiritual exercises based on the intentional adoption of aesthetic emotions while performing in a theatrical production. So what's a superheroic dose? 
Well, the way we're defining it, it's five to 10 grams of psilocybin mushrooms, plus a water extract of three to four grams of Syrian root seeds, a combination often known as psilocybin, plus multiple hits of cannabis, plus vape TMT, plus shamanic rape. The goal was to be able to function at a high level while under extreme psychic load. For example, maintaining a devotional attitude as you change costumes off stage in the dark during a two minute break between songs while mounting a psychic defense against the demonic entity trying to kill you. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what it means. Some say that only indigenous people should claim to practice shamanism. Shamanism is a universal human capacity a set of techniques that allow you to access other levels of reality, deal with what you find there, and create change back here in the everyday world. The phonomantic method and its entheotrainments are stylish DIY entheogenic shamanism rooted in 20th century Western popular culture and powered by 21st century technology. All right, going beyond the shamanic cabaret. After five years of training with phonomantic rites and publicly performing entheotrainments, I realized religion and didn't have to end when the effects of the mushrooms wore off. What was required was a larger container, an imaginal universe where people could have shared experiences. These experiences could be improved by disciplined training people could do together in everyday life. I wondered, how can I tie this all together? Part three, parareality games. God is real, but, re <laughs> sorry. God is real, but religion is make-believe. The great world religions are based on miraculous stories of, of confrontation with an unthinkable ultimate reality. Jesus died on the cross and returned after three days. The Buddha overcame the demon Mara to sit for 49 days under the Bodhi tree and experience ultimate enlightenment. The prophet Muhammad was handed the Quran by the archangel Gabriel. There's no actual proof that any of these things actually happened. What we have are written accounts written down decades after the supposed fact by people who weren't even there to witness it, right? So until somebody invents a time machine so we can go back and get some video, the best we can really truly honestly say is that these things are, you know, kind of made up, quasi-fictional, imaginally true, but that's all they need to be. By acting with others as if these stories are true, Believers in these traditional sacred stories improve their lives and create social bonds. In other words, they are playing games of sacred make-believe that can yield real-world transformational results. If religion is a game, we can stop looking only backward at stories that may or may not be true. We can stop trying to fix what is now irreparably broken. We can stop being so damn literal. The innovational history of religion doesn't have to be over. We are free to create new and ever more sophisticated and involving and efficacious religion games. Parareality games are complete out-of-the-box systems of concepts, practices, and beliefs that enable experiences of the transcendent while simultaneously creating community in which such experiences may be anchored. In other words, a parareality game is a way to religion that is no less earnest or life-changing for being admittedly quasi-fictional. The First Church of David Bowie's Shamanic Cabaret is performed in the context of a parareality para game called Phonomancer. In Phonomancer, you role play as a member of a 23rd century religion. You believe the goddess returned to historical time in the form of the rock and pop music of the late 20th century, and that by singing and dancing along, you can unlock her spirit and enter visionary trance states. Phonomancer is played at three levels. In Phonomancer Basic, you get high on psilocybin mushrooms and get down at ritual magic jukebox musical dance parties. In Phonomancer Advanced, the game becomes a program for self-actualization as you incorporate additional beliefs and daily training practices intended to improve your performance in the jukebox musicals and everyday life. In Phonomancer Expert, you strive to become a self-aware game piece in a cosmic contest that ends either in humanity's destruction or its apotheosis. Because it is based on the phonomantic method, Phonomancer can deliver gnosis. It's a game that becomes reality the moment it puts you up close and personal with the goddess. The Christian church father, Tertullian, supposedly said, credo kia absurdum, I believe because it is absurd. But we say, credo kia iocus et quia operator, I believe because it's fun and because it works. We've taken a brief look at the concepts and practices that inform Phonomancer, but not the beliefs. 
Phonomancer has a complete mythos comprising a cosmogony, a teleology, an ontology, a soteriology, and an eschatology. It was inspired both by personal visionary experience and years of study in physical training, performance arts, comparative religion, Jungian psychology, and pop culture. The Phonomancer mythos is as true as it is useful in orienting you toward a life of joy and integrity. It establishes an imaginal reality in which people can have shared experiences. These shared experiences create a community of people who strive together to realize their highest potentials. Phonomancer is deep played make-believe that can yield real world transformative results, just like every other religion. Parareality games like Phonomancer could be the religions of the science fictional future. Admittedly quasi-fictional, no parareality game could claim to have a lock on truth. Everyone will know it's all a matter of taste. There can be as many kinds of fruitful parareality games as there are artists to design them and people willing to play them. Religion will be art and art will be religion. Part four, the psychedelic future of religion. Long ago, Communities consumed the substantia and partied and carried on until their spirits caught fire. God spoke from the flames. People listened and learned. In the modern era, Grateful Dead shows and Psytrance festivals have been steps back in the right direction. By yoking wild joy to hard work via the phonomantic method, entheotrainments can take ecstatic ceremonies all the way into the future. All the rock and pop songs in the cabaret are my ikaros, Sacred songs I can use to open to the divine. And you've got your own. If we've got some sacred songs in common, then by God, let's have a party. And if we don't, you can always get together with your friends and make your own entheotrainments. It is my most sincere hope that the ideas I've presented today will eventually inspire millions of virtuosic visionaries who endlessly innovate new ways to experience God. Each will be an opportunity to see God through the eyes of the creating artists and hopefully gain a new perspective that improves your own understanding. People could visit a nightclub that is also a church to take part in a ritual that allows them to experience transcendent reality as goddess, and the next month attend another entheotrainment that offers a way to access the divine and its aspect is void, and then later one that worships the earth as a self-aware superorganism. The timid will speak, excuse me, the timid will stick with familiar versions of God while the adventurous can pursue, pursue ever more outre visions of the mystery. Hopefully someday, nimble, pragmatic curiosity will be the common attitude towards spiritual practice instead of dead-eyed and heavy-footed orthodoxy. While assessing their options, people will ask, does this game of high stakes make-believe get me up close and personal with the deity of my choice? Will it change me? Will it charge me? Does it really work? Because in the end, when it comes to religion, whether it really works is all that matters. All right. If you're curious about what I was telling you today, I've written three books over the last four years. The first is a spiritual autobiography and the story of how all this got started called Spotify the Gnostics, Here's the First Church of David Bowie. Then last year, I published a book called AP Psychedelics, Going Beyond Set and Setting to Achieve Visionary Virtuosity. That goes in depth into the phonomantic method. And then finally, this year, I, I published the Phonomancer Player's Handbook, which recaps the phonomantic method, but then also explains the beliefs and the mythos behind the, the game of Phonomancer. Um, we're so, there's a few copies for sale up front of that. AP Psychedelics and the Phonomancer Player's Handbook are also on YouTube as audiobooks. So it's free. Just remember, you get what you pay for. All right. Um, tonight at 7 p.m. at the St. David Bowie Entheo Gym, we're doing our weekly service, a special Sunday version of our weekly service. It's called the Discotheque at the End of the Universe. This is not the three-and-a-half-hour shamanic cabaret. This is a 75-minute service. But it's built around the last part of the cabaret, which is the Anne Frank working, that rite of atonement I referred to. It's ritual magic that's intended to prevent the end of the world. And it is quite a thing. So I highly encourage you to drop by. Uh, space is somewhat limited. I can fit about 30 people or so in that, in that space. So, and please try to be on time because we're gonna kick it off as close to seven o'clock as we can. It's, even if you're on foot, it's fairly close by. The, the gym is literally like a mile and a half down the street. Just go south on 11th and then on to Milwaukee and then you'll basically be there. Um, is there any time left? 
Oh, thanks, yeah. It's, uh, the, the address, if you want to write it down, is 4033 Southeast Milwaukee Avenue, which coincidentally is the site of the Sanctum Psychedelic Thrift Store put on by our own Edwin Woodruff, yeah. Um, so that's gonna, we're really hoping that eventually that location is gonna be a national center for psychedelic education and expanding ideas of practice. 